Hello everybody, welcome to the MNB World Talk Show. Today we have invited a person who established a cheesemaking company in Mongolia. He is an executive director at Mongolian Cheesemakers Union LLC. Please welcome Michael Morrow. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation. Thank you for having me, Susanna. I'm very happy to be here. <laughs> Thank mm -hmm. you. Um, could you please tell us why did you decide to work in Mongolia? Why did you decide to come to Mongolia and start your own business here? Um, I've been in Asia most of my adult life, ever since 1966, and I've lived in many different countries. And most, most relevant, uh, before coming to Mongolia, I was living in China. I was in Hong Kong and China for over mm -hmm. 25 years. In the context of that experience, um, I had set up a subsidiary company for, for the company I had in China, mm -hmm. um, here in Mongolia. That got me coming here. Mm -hmm. And I, I like Mongolia from the beginning. Um, it's somewhat similar to um, my home in North America. Mm -hmm. And um, I thought there was a lot of opportunity here. I thought it was also a, ver a very good place for somebody like me, uh, you know, more or less at the end of his career. Mm -hmm. And mm. why did you decide to make business in that rare industry, cheese making? Um, it was serendipitous. It wasn't my intention uh, when I came here, but in 2014, I met uh, Tumor Hoek Ertnesan. He is the pioneer artisan cheesemaker mm. in Mongolia, um, the doyen of cheesemakers, mm -hmm. who is still making uh, his Hustai Hauda, um, Mongolia's first and still one of Mongolia's Yo. best cheeses. Mm. In fact, he's been making it for 25 years. This is the 25th anniversary of Tumorhoek's cheese. Mm -hmm. um, I met Tumorhoek when he was in some difficulty. He has a small cheese plant way out in the bush, um, south southeast of uh, Hustai National Park. Mm -hmm. um, I was fascinated by what he was doing. Um, I recognized what I thought was um, something very special there. And I thought there was also an opportunity, um, especially because I had so much business experience, to help him and, uh, to, or to work with him mm -hmm. to develop um, this concept of uh, making very high quality cheeses from the milk of the nomadic dairy mm -hmm. into world class products. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you call the com the company right, artisan cheesemakers. So, um, Mongolian artisan cheesemakers yes. union. Tell mm -hmm. us about the more about the word artisan. So this is connected with handmade work, right? Tell us the, about the peculiarities of your cheese. Well, artisan is generally associated with skill or uh, with skilled craftsmanship generally associated with small scale. Um, it's often also, in, with regard to cheese making, associated with a particular place or a p particular mm -hmm. cheese maker. So uh, the tradition of artisan cheese making really comes from Europe. If you were to go um, today to, let's say, France or mm -hmm. to Italy or yeah. Switzerland, you would find many small cheese makers. Some of them have been making um, a cheese now famous, or they and their ancestors, maybe for hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. um, what we are talking about here in Mongolia is trying to develop small-scale cheese making of high quality by craftsmen like Tumorhoek, mm -hmm. um, and making those products, uh, signature products of Mongolia in interna international markets. And mm -hmm. we feel that there are there, that opportunity exists, especially now when the artisan cheese business mm -hmm. is actually uh, growing quite rapidly uh, mm -hmm. worldwide. Mm -hmm. I see. Thank you very much. Now then, let's introduce you to our audience a little bit more in CV and photos, shall we? Okay.
thank you. Uh, now let us continue about your first impression of Mongolia, right? Where, when exactly did you come to Mongolia and how Mongolia was different to you from that what you were expecting? Um, as I said before, I lived in China for a long time. Mm -hmm. If you live in China, you hear about Mongolia, but I didn't have clear um, expectations of, of Mongolia. Mm. Um, I think I first came to Mongolia just as a tourist, maybe as early as 2004, 2005, during mm -hmm. Tsagansar mm -hmm. or Lunar New Year. Um, the company I was running in um, China, uh, a Silicon Valley company subsidiary, actually set up a subsidiary company here in mm -hmm. 2008. And uh, so in connection with that, I would come a couple of times a year and I got to know Mongolia slowly. Um, I think the first observation I had of Mongolia and what made me very curious about it was that it was so different mm. from not only China, where I'd spent a lot of time, but also the Southeast Asian world, where I, I had mm. been, even in India. I, you know, I've spent most of my life roaming around in Asia, but this was a very special part of Asia. Mm -hmm. And I, could, I became fascinated by the culture of Mongolia, and I guess curious about how, how and why it was so different. I became interested in the history. I became interested mm. in the geography. And um, my curiosity led me in. How is Mongolia different from what I initially thought? I think it's a much more difficult society to enter than I initially thought. I mm -hmm. thought it was rather, you know, I thought it was rather simple compared with uh, China, mm -hmm. but actually it has its own complexities and mm. um, such as well, let's say in business. I, I think Mongolians are very independent and um, um, they uh, very very hard to get people to cooperate here compared mm. with, for example, in China mm. or a Southeast Asian country. Um, there may there are many reasons for that, and no need to go into them. But it was something I had mm -hmm. to learn. I'm still learning. Mm -hmm. mm, I see. Okay, uh, now let's talk about the, your team. Uh, so when you first started your business in 2015, right here, and I mean your cheese making company, right? So tell us about your team. How did you start? How many people were in your team and how maybe did you choose people to work with you? How mm. that happens? Um, you know, I have a background in startup companies. In fact, it's what I like to do. Um, during my life, I've started uh, several companies. And um, actually, once a company becomes successful, I get bored with it mm -hmm. and I move on to something else. Mm -hmm. That's what happened to me in China. Mm -hmm. I had a very successful company, but it, it actually ceased to be interesting to me once it became routine. Mm -hmm. um, when I came to Mongolia uh, and I met Tumurhuk Ertnesan, I became fascinated with this idea that there was all this milk Mm. In the countryside, you know, mm. you have about a billion liters of milk here that is not really uh, utilized. Mm. Um, and I became fascinated with the idea that Mongolia is a great commons, maybe the last great commons with wild grasses and natural environment. And I thought that this could be developed um, as a kind of a a, a, a product type that could be differentiated in world markets very easily. Mm -hmm. So um, as I, uh, you know, started into that, I first of all met Tumurhuk Ertnesan. And um, I didn't have a team. I didn't even really have a clear idea of what I wanted to do. But I, I studied carefully what he was doing. And uh, not just from a business point of view, I, I studied his small cheese plant, I studied the relationships with the countryside, mm -hmm. uh, the relationship mm -hmm. with the herding community and so on. Um, the, perhaps the first thing I did other than start to work with Tumerhoek and try to uh, kind of use my skills to help him develop his business, uh, was I got my wife involved, my wife is Chinese, and um, 
she, uh, she went to France and studied cheese making. Mm. Um, I've been involved for quite some time, but I couldn't make a piece of cheese to save my life if mm -hmm. I'm telling you the truth. But mm -hmm. she became a very competent cheesemaker very quickly and came back. And, we, and she became really my uh, very important uh, to the, the process of trying to learn about and get started um, in you know the cheese making business you know the the goal that we have is actually to make artisan cheese making part of the fabric of 21st century nomadic uh, pastoralism and mm -hmm. uh, what that means is bringing a lot of people from the countryside into our team mm -hmm. um, you know my I used after I met turmeric I took a year off and I did nothing but uh, study cheese making mm -hmm. and cheese how to build a cheese factory and I uh, made a 10-year business plan and I decided that we could build a hundred cheese plants across Mongolia mm -hmm. and that we could build a network and that we could essentially establish an, a, an industry here that would contribute to the development of communities across Mongolia. And that's basically what we've been doing with, mm -hmm. always with uh, local people as partners. I spend a great deal of time going out into the countryside and meeting people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And today is mm -hmm. 2020, right? You started your business in 2015. How your business grew up within five years? Well, it grew up very slowly. Mm -hmm. I, I, um, it sounds maybe like a short time, but to me it's been quite a long time. And to put it into perspective, in, in five years of starting a business from zero in China, mm -hmm. um, five years after starting a business in China, um, I had built a national a business involved in every province of China mm -hmm. and that was with revenues of uh, tens of millions of dollars, let's mm -hmm. put it this way. Um, and a, a business that's still growing there, even though I've left it behind. It, it, it's been quite hard to get this business started in Mongolia. And, and maybe you can say it, 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 it isn't that hard because it's quite a new, it's, I'm, we're not the first ones to do it, but it's a new idea to try and develop it at the scale we've been going at it. And there were, we've encountered problems that I didn't expect. For example, the difficulty of uh, exporting cheeses from Mongolia to mm -hmm. foreign countries. It's still a problem we're facing. Mm -hmm. But we're, we're making progress, and especially in the last year, we've made a lot of progress, despite the COVID-19 pandemic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, how long can we keep cheese after making it? Well, first of all, you know, there are literally thousands of varieties of artisan cheeses. Mm -hmm. uh, France alone, has somewhere over 500 different types yeah. of cheeses, often made only a particular cheese made only in one little place in France. So we have to, in answering your question, we have to basically say which cheese, what kind of cheese, what the shelf lives of cheeses um, uh, are quite different one to the other. Uh, let me give you an example, mozzarella, which mm -hmm. we all know as well as a pizza cheese or we eat it in yeah. caprese salad or whatever. It has a very short shelf life. It's a lactic cheese that we basically uh, should eat, if, if, especially the fresh mozzarella, we should eat within uh, three or four or five days of its production. Mm -hmm. But if you take um, a cheese like for example, Tumerhoek's cheese, uh, Hustai Hauda, uh, we are, that cheese gets better and better uh, like a good wine year after year. We have some uh, now that's two years old that we're selling. Mm -hmm. uh, Parmigiano, a very famous um, cheese, uh, Italian cheese Italian. sold into world markets, um, is often not even put into the market until it's six years old. So. Um, you know, the, the, we, we have to first talk about the cheese and then yeah, we have okay. to talk about so how we age it and how it develops and, and so on before we can answer the question. But okay. uh, there isn't, 
much to you know, people worry a lot more than they should about cheeses kind of going bad. Cheese is, a, generally speaking, a very safe product compared with even yogurt or milk or, mm -hmm. for example, meat. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's a probiotic Long product <laughs> with, with its own cultural environment that, it, that defends itself against mm -hmm. bad bacteria. Okay, thank you very much. Now then let's take a look to the next package with your work. Okay, this is our model factory. We call it the White Mountain Factory. It's on the outskirts of Ulaanbaatar. Here we produce a range of cheeses um, experimentally. Uh, a typical factory like this, however, would only produce one or two cheeses. Here we can store up to about five tons of cheese. A typical plant like this um, producing through the summer through what we call 100 days of summer, could produce probably um, around um, 100 to 200 uh, kilograms of cheese a day, or about 20 tons of cheese in a summer uh, lactation period. This plant we keep running um, throughout the year as for experimental purposes, uh, to produce some cheeses for our fromagerie, also for training. But as I said, a country plant would operate, most likely operate only during the summer period. Um, we've been running this plant now for two years. Uh, it, we're quite happy with it. It, uh, it uh, produces very high quality cheeses. It, we can do everything we want to do here. Um, we are happy to introduce this plant to others. Wow, interesting. Uh, now I would like to ask you another question about, again, your business. Uh, what the biggest lesson has been learned during your business making time in Mongolia? Um, I think the biggest lesson I've learned is that um, what I've, what I've uh, undertaken here is much more difficult than I thought it would be and it's going to take longer. Mm -hmm. um, you know I've been at it more or less five years and um, I think we're just getting started and so I guess what I the, the line you draw under that is that if you're going to start a business in Mongolia especially in a new area you should have quite a long time horizon and you need to be patient mm -hmm. um, and you need to be focused and you need to be dedicated to that business mm -hmm. um, in a way that um, in a greater way than certainly was my experience in China and Southeast Asia before coming here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you also mentioned about that you were many times in the countries of Southeastern Asia, right? Uh, also, I know that you have participated in the Vietnam War. Uh, when exactly? Could you please tell us about that well, time? I, I participated in the war in the sense that I was a journalist covering the war. I was never a soldier, although I was assigned. Uh, I traveled with uh, soldiers in combat situations um, a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the Vietnam War... Um, more or less started in 1966 and more or less ended, um, well, it did end in 1975. Mm -hmm. um, I was involved in Vietnam itself from 1967 mm -hmm. until 19, the end of 1970. Mm -hmm. And then I, I, was, I was involved in the war in Laos, which was associated with it afterwards. And the war, I was, during that, earlier period I was also involved in Cambodia mm -hmm. and I was also involved in ins covering insurgencies in Southeast Asia also in um, Thailand also mm -hmm. and then did other kinds of reporting political and economic reporting across Southeast Asia for a number of years. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, how this war influenced on your personality? 
I understand what you're asking. I, you know, I was very young when I w went uh, into the this when I began this experience. I was 22, and um, I, you know, I grew up very quickly, mm -hmm. and um, so it was a maturing experience certainly, um, and it taught me to appreciate. Um, first of all, to appreciate life, life itself, uh, life itself mm -hmm. because, uh, you know, uh, war, unfortunately, is about killing people. Yes. And you, you can be killed yourself or you s certainly can be around people mm -hmm. who are killed or are being killed. And so you, you learn to value the time of your life. Mm -hmm. to to appreciate and to appreciate a lot of very small things you know although i'm a businessman money has never really made uh, big, m big. M much difference mm -hmm. to me m money as they say is a way of keeping score uh, of proving that you are actually doing something that is sustainable but i'm i think it it really taught me uh, to appreciate a lot of things uh, other than material things mm -hmm. and it taught me to use my time well mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay but mm -hmm. you are there as a journalist right right so mm -hmm. are you a journalist what is your major what did i study in, yes. in university mm -hmm. i studied international relations and i i had a focus uh, on um, China. I studied Chinese history in the context of that. I studied Chinese language. Mm -hmm. uh, after I went to Vietnam, I studied Vietnamese. I was quite Im immersed from the, t from the time I was a, a young person, mm -hmm. um, a, a university student. I was quite Im immersed in Asia even before I, I went to Asia or came to Asia. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what language do you speak? Now? Yeah. Uh, I've forgotten most of the languages I speak, but I still I still speak Chinese very well because it's uh, I just I used to run a company in which I was the, the only foreigner. Language. My yeah. wife is Chinese and so on. Um, I used to speak Vietnamese quite well. I can't say I speak it well anymore. Um, uh, Cantonese, which is the language of Hong Kong, a wow. variant of Chinese. I, and my first love actually was Spanish, and um, I regret that I've lost my Spanish language because it's been so long. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Also, I know that you write some poems, right? Uh, it's a hobby, it's um, a but I've yes, I've been interested in in. Um, in poetry since I was quite young. I was very interested in Spanish poetry at one point. I'm interested in Chinese poetry, especially Tang, Tang poetry. Um, and of course, I write a little bit of poetry of my own. Mm -hmm. And in what languages did you write them? Um, generally, I write, um, most of the poetry I write, I write in English. Some of it I've written after Spanish poets. That is, I, I, I write a poem in English that is modeled on a famous poem written in Spanish. I've written uh, one or two poems. Um, I've written a few poems in, in Chinese. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. and could you please read for us a part of your poem? Let's take a look then on the next package, okay, with your hobby. All mothers are of the earth, but our mother was of Polish amber, a hard, translucent pebble, equal to herself, mindful. God helps those who help themselves, she'd say, cherishing each ray of warmth, staring down each day of gray, like a cat's eye, ossified. Drink your tea, take your bath. I'll have dinner when you're back, she'd say. Respectful of time, conscious of our destinies. Sure that wisdom forms, if it forms at all, in private darkness. Good to see you, you must be tired. Thanks for coming, she'd say. And to the end, she was the same looking with a very calm gaze, giving off a very cool ardor, opulent only in her dignity. 
How many stations of the cross, how much toil, failed expectations, how many secret beads of tears through twisted fingers to get that weathered lens to make that Polish stone. And now, as we lay you down, how many centuries in the soil, how much war, false sons, lost generations, how much courage before we too can be that fire that burns within. Wow, so impressive. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, now let's talk about your free time. How do you spend your free time? Uh, how do you spend your time with your children? Could you please tell us about it? Well, to be quite honest, since uh, I've come to Mongolia, I don't have a great deal of free time. Um, you know, trying to start a new business in a new industry is really, uh, really absorbs uh, most of my time. Mm -hmm. What I like to do, uh, I like to hike, I like to ride horses. Um, I still have my father's uh, saddle, a 1905 McClellan saddle, uh, which works very well on a Mongolian horse. Um, I like to spend time with my children. Unfortunately, we, we have a strange situation in our family now because mm -hmm. of the, the COVID, COVID virus. Okay. My, my wife and my smallest, uh, my small daughter, my youngest daughter, uh, went back to China to see the grandparents at um, Tsagansar or at Lunar New Year and got stuck there. They're still stuck there. Oh, sorry. They <laughs> cannot return. Until uh, maybe soon they will be, but anyway, they're happy enough there, but we are separated. Mm -hmm. I have my uh, older daughter here. She She's probably the one who's suffering most because she has to live with me. Yeah. And, um, w you know, I, I get about the time I get home, she's getting up because she's actually studying in online mm -hmm. at a Canadian university, but the, because of the time zones, she... Uh, attends her classes from midnight until six in the morning. Mm -hmm. So there isn't a great deal of time right now for family activity. Um, in more normal times, um, I, I especially enjoyed uh, the time uh, I had with my uh, little daughter uh, because uh, she uh, actually seems to enjoy uh, spending time with me more than my teenage daughter. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we uh, do all kinds of things. Fathers more. Yeah, daughters are very yeah. good for fathers. Yes, yes mm -hmm. exactly. Mm -hmm. And let's uh, conclude our today's episode with the last mm -hmm. question, which will be about your future goals. Do you have a dream? What goals do you have for the future? Yeah, I, I have uh, one major business goal and that is to get this network of small cheese plants established across Mongolia in a way that is that uh, they are sustainable and that means in a way that they uh, are sustainable without my participation mm -hmm. um, you know I'm uh, reaching the end of my business life and um, I would hope within five years another five years we will have this network of 100 cheese plants up and running we'll have the exports moving to Russia, China, etc. Mm -hmm. And um, I would be qu quite happy to um, step into the background, ride my horse, go fishing, spend some time with my family. And they, yeah, that's enough. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Mm. Thank you very much for your time, for your coming to our mm. studio. And we wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Susan. Of course. Thank mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. Dear viewers, today we had an executive director of a Mongo at Mongolian Artisan Cheesemakers Union, Mr. Michael Morrow. We will see you next Wednesday. Have a nice evening. Goodbye.